Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Computomics podcast. Today we will be digging into maize research and I'm happy to introduce our guest. She's an assistant professor of maize genetics and genomics at the Department of Plant, Soil and Microbial Sciences at Michigan State University, Addie Thompson. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great to have you. So I was wondering, Addie, one of my favorite barbecue dishes is actually grilled corn. <laughs> And I was wondering, what's your barbecue go-to? My barbecue go-to? Well, I mean, grilled corn is obviously excellent. Uh, I think the last few years, we've been making it sort of as elote, so more the Mexican style where you put, uh, after you grill it, you put on sort of a, a cheese, creamy and spicy sort of uh, mix onto it. So that makes it a little bit fun. But I, you can't beat a good brisket. So that's uh... <laughs> <laughs> that's also a classic for sure. Um, speaking of maize, I mean, I already said it in the introduction. It's kind of one of your main uh, plants that you deal with in your research. Can you give us a bit of an overview? What areas of research do you focus on? Sure. Uh, the main overarching goal of the program is to improve plant breeding research, uh, to improve plant breeding. And so our research always centers around that sort of main theme. But within that, we have a few different areas of focus, mostly in the area of either quantitative genetics or in predictive high throughput phenotyping, so phenomics. Uh, as far as what traits we focus on, that varies a little bit based on current interests. But right now, uh, one of our projects works on looking at disease resistance to tar spot, which is a new fungal pathogen in the region. It's a disease caused by a fungal pathogen. Another area of research is on response to nitrogen. So how different varieties respond differently to nitrogen that's applied. Uh, and then another major area is trying to learn about canopy architecture, by which I mean sort of the size and shape and arrangement of the plant parts and leaves within a field uh, and how that influences resource capture and particularly how we can measure different sort of parameter traits and explain that uh, size and shape, and we call it architecture of the canopy, in a way that lets us parameterize other models that we can uh, use like process-based models to incorporate things like weather and soil information. Mm -hmm. um, let's jump in the, into the canopy one that you just kind of la outlined a little bit there. So um, how do you go about measuring those, those parameter traits, if you can share? For sure, yeah. Uh, so I would love to say that we have some magical, amazing approaches, which we do have a few, but every <laughs> good computational approach starts out with a lot of hand measured traits. And mm. so the first thing that we did when I first started here actually was to collect a lot of data by hand on the ground. And so we were measuring things like Uh, you know, plant height and ear height, but then also leaf number and leaf sizes and where the ear is on the plant, what leaf number that's at, uh, and sort of the arrangement of the, the plant parts. And there's a couple of shortcuts that we can use. So the leaf sizes by leaf number actually follow a nice little power function. And so we can kind of use that to learn about the other, the other leaves within the canopy by just measuring one or two key traits. Mm. Uh, what we have been working on now is using high throughput data to get at some of those traits. So we have the ability from aerial imagery using drones mm -hmm. to collect different types of data. And one of, one of the ones we've found quite useful for structural parameters is actually LIDAR data. So this is where you have sort of spinning lasers that bounce off of objects and then measures the time to return to the sensor. And then that lets you see kind of a point cloud in space. And that has been pretty useful from our experience in determining some of these uh, architectural traits. So do you combine the, the very kind of ha literally hands-on <laughs> manual data collection with uh, something like, yeah, very high-tech, high-throughput um, data collection method? How do you exactly. combine that data? We have to use different modeling and prediction techniques. In that case, we were using a convolutional neural network but it varies uh, what sort of approach we use kind of varies based on the data types. Mm. Uh, in this case, it's, it, it was a, a voxel model that was developed by Daniel Morris, who's uh, here at Michigan State. So we, we have a lot of collaborators that we partner with. 
uh, but he created sort of a set of voxels throughout the plot that would then describe the probability that any of the points in the point cloud fall within that point in space. And that made the data more amenable to being used in a neural network in that way. But depending right. on the, the type of data, we use different approaches. And so a lot of times if we're using something like spectral imagery or what we call RGB imagery, which is just natural color light, uh, we can use computer software to just draw sort of a, a box over the plot. And then we extract all the data from the pixels. And then you get uh, whatever sort of summary statistic per plot that you want, uh, whether that's the mean of the different pixels in the plot or the, the deviation. And then we can use those into any sort of computational model that just, you know, it, it works on like a, a matrix of data. So it's um, pretty straightforward in that way. Mm -hmm. Can you give an example of maybe a result based on that data that uh, that's, that came from one of your projects? Yeah. Uh, and rather than focus on the, the LiDAR data, again, actually, I'm going to move over to um, a project that was recently done by one of my graduating PhD students. And he was working with a really commonly used, what we call a vegetative index. Mm -hmm. um, this is where we have different wavelengths of light from multispectral data that are used uh, to calculate uh, an index where you, you take the two wavelengths of light relative to each other. And so the one he was using as his first example was called NDVI, which is really, really common, it stands for normalized difference vegetative index. But it's basically a ratio of near infrared light to red light. And so he was seeing that early in the season that is really predictive of things like leaf area index and stand count. But later in the season, it captures unique information because what he's picking up on is sort of the, the grain filling period and how long the canopy stays green. So mm -hmm. NDVI is really good at capturing greenness, whether that's in terms of plant health or uh, nitrogen or water content, uh, different types of stresses can be related to disease or even insect pressure. Um, basically, how healthy is the canopy? And so he was uh, extracting that information to see what what of our hand measured traits were uh, captured in NDVI and what weren't, and how that was informative for yield predictions. Nice. So it's almost it's it's doing the actual research on, for example, the greenness trait, but also about the methodology and how like different the different approaches, the different data collection methods uh, can be used for capturing different traits. Yes, and then because we're geneticists, we also like to genetically map everything. So this mm -hmm. was done in diversity panels and in sort of hybrid populations. And so he also did a genome-wide association study and was able to connect genes, candidate genes for NDVI along with other plant traits that we measured. Early in the season, that would be things like stand count, but later on, things like root lodging. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Would you consider that to be one of the most innovative uh, approaches that you've used? or is it kind of in the middle of the pack? I would say that's that's toward the middle. I think his innovation was kind of in how he was pulling data out of of the repeated measures across the season. But mm -hmm. I think the LiDAR data is probably one of the most innovative, although I, I can't take as much credit for some of the innovation um, <laughs> because the actual computational piece itself was a partnership um, on campus. We had actually created sort of a, a larger collaborative, we called it phenomics at MSU for lack of a better name, Mm -hmm. um, but through an internal initiative, we actually funded some of the hardware that was used to collect the data, as well as some of the data collection and pre-processing itself. It was, it was intended to be a way to put together engineers, computer scientists, plant scientists, plant breeders, um, over 20 people across campus to actually kind of start getting some of these data sets to do this sort of work. And I think it was pretty successful if I say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like uh, I've, I've had a couple of these interviews um, where this kind of interdisciplinary approach seemed to yield the best results because it is so complex and, and collecting, getting good data is so crucial um, to have different perspectives, different methods, uh, and, and kind of mold them into a new approach uh, tends to, yeah, tends to lead to good results. Absolutely. It's critical. And this is what I tell people is that if you want to do really well in this area, you have to have, you know, 10 or 15 different skill sets and you can't be an expert in that many things. You can exactly. be an expert in a few of them and you can have people in your labs that are experts in some of them, but you really do need collaborations to, to be on the cutting edge of some of the research. Mm -hmm. Let's jump to the TAR spot. I, I know that in 2022, you and your colleagues received a $590,000 grant from um, USDA, I think, um, to, to research resistance to TAR spot, which is a 
pretty devastating corn disease. Can you describe what the disease is and, and how prevalent it is worldwide? Absolutely, yeah. So tar spot is a disease that only affects maize. It's caused by the pathogen Phylacromatis. It's an ascomycete fungi, and it's spread sort of through wind and water, but it causes raised, shiny black spots on the leaves that you can't scratch off. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the test, is if you sort of lick your finger and scratch at the leaf. If it comes off, it was probably dirt or insect grass or something, but <laughs> Uh, if it doesn't come off, then that might be tar spot. Uh, it can have sort of necrotic lesions around it, but not always. But the problem is that it breaks down the canopy very quickly, pulls nutrients from the stalk, uh, and it also reduces the photosynthetic capacity as it covers the leaves. So what that leads to then is up to a 40% yield loss, but also can increase lodging uh, and decrease the quality of either the grain or the forage. So this, interestingly, it's a century-old disease in Central and South America, but it's new to the upper Midwest as of about 2015. And so it's been spreading from its initial discovery uh, right near the tip of the Great Lakes and has been spreading out into all throughout the upper Midwest. It thrives in sort of humid conditions. And so it's been found in a lot of counties, uh, though the severity has not been terrible outside of kind of the Great Lakes region where it's nice and humid. Mm -hmm. But if we have a wet year, I think that could be potentially more devastating in later uh, later years. I will mention that the grant that you mentioned is actually the second uh, that we received. So I have to give credit to the USDA because they funded this quite early on and then uh, actually funded a follow-up to investigate more into the mechanistics. But that's been the one project where I get to pretend that I'm a plant breeder. So <laughs> I don't actually release varieties, but I get to make new germplasm and do selections and screening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's let's jump into that into a little more detail. So, so how are you going about better understanding the mechanisms of resistance um, in in order to, I guess, hopefully prevent future yield losses? Because forty percent that's that's a sizable number. Yeah. Well, our first step with the first grant was to screen as many varieties as we could find. Now, because this is an upper Midwest around the Great Lakes sort of disease, uh, we started by screening a couple of different populations. One was a subset of what we call the Wisconsin Diversity Panel. And so this was a, a panel of diverse and bred lines that was selected to have kind of a restricted phenology, by mm -hmm. which I really just mean it can flower in Wisconsin. So I figured if it could flower in Wisconsin, it could probably flower in Michigan. So I started there uh, because we wanted to find temperate sources of resistance. We know this is a tropical disease, so I know there would probably be some resistance in tropical varieties, but the challenges are that First of all, tropical varieties would not necessarily flower here, so it would be logistically challenging. Mm -hmm. And those varieties would not have had uh, as much breeding for resistance to other diseases potentially. And so we also did screen some of the, they're called the germplasm enhancement for maize varieties. This is a pretty cool program run out of Iowa State through the USDA. And it's uh, where they, they have been combining elite tropical material, diverse tropical material with elite industry uh, material. And so then they release these, these populations and varieties to sort of increase the diversity present in elite breeding material. I think that's been very successful. So we screened some of those lines. We screened some of those guns and diversity panel lines. We found resistance and started breeding that in um, to a couple of different parent lines and making uh, basically genetic research populations to use. So we did uh, genetic mapping and then we also did mapping in other populations as validation. Um, but the way that we're looking at mechanisms right now is first of all, sort of validating and testing some of the candidate genes we've been looking at, but also um, we've gotten interested in looking at phenolic compound accumulation. And so the goal of this next uh, sort of grant funding period is that we're going to be measuring the phenolic compounds in the leaves and seeing how either the natural accumulation of phenolic compounds impacts the resistance to tar spot or how tar spot impacts the phenolic compound accumulation in the leaves. So is it, is it a response or a, a preventative measure? So we're, we're doing that in terms of the wet chemistry, but then we're also taking sort of a, a tiered hyperspectral approach um, so that maybe in the future we don't have to do as much wet chemistry. So that's that's a collaboration I should mention with Marty Chilvers, who's a field crops pathologist, Eric Grotewald, who's a biochemist, uh, Aaron Bunting, who is the remote sensing and geospatial information systems director on campus, and then Jessica Meisel, who's over in forestry, who knows a lot about the one of the hyperspectral devices that we're using. Mm -hmm. 
once again, interdisciplinary <laughs> team. Always, uh, always. Yeah. And the first round, I should also mention, we had a couple of other states involved. So there were individuals at Wisconsin and Indiana who were growing field sites for us and helping us out. You probably needed some data to even be able to uh, to apply for that USDA grant. So uh, where were you at before with the, with the research? Yeah, this is a really good question. So when I first started at MSU, uh, I, I was you know brand new and starting a program from scratch. And so one of the ways that we actually were able to obtain seed funding was through the Plant Resilience Institute, which I'm a part of, as well as an internal initiative called Project Green. And that allowed us to collect some of that preliminary data that we needed to use to apply for the USDA grant. So I, I really appreciate a lot of these these initiatives and mechanisms to start off with seed funding and actually be able to obtain data like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you also tried to, f to create predictive models. That's mostly what's happening in the new grant. Okay. Um, the previous grant was mostly screening for resistance mm -hmm. and doing some of the breeding work. So this was funded through the USDA's plant breeding sort of program. And so we were doing gotcha. some pre-breeding for resistance. Yeah. Right. And so so the preliminary results so far are that you've identified specific traits and that you've that you've they are now set up to to, for example, concentrate on the phenolic compounds, find out more about that and from that create models. So that's kind of the outlook when the project is done, hopefully, correct? I think that's about it. Yeah. The I would say more so than specific traits, we've got specific varieties now at this point. And we've developed some breeding populations. Um That's, I'm really quite pleased and, and happy that the USDA was supportive of this initial grant because I, I think it was innovative in a few ways, but what we did was we partnered with some industry groups and with public institutions as well to make sure that everything that we're producing is going to be open source, basically. And so all the germplasm and populations that come out of this will be sent to the repository in Ames, where mm -hmm. they'll be available for anyone to order, public or private sector. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm excited about that possibility, and we'll have some populations that are genotyped as well as phenotyped, and they can be used for further research as well. That is very cool indeed, and and not that common, I would say, is it? Uh, yeah, it's it's not super common. I think I'm in a unique position because I'm not really releasing varieties here at Michigan State, at least not at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do have a pretty strong passion um, for the land grant research mission and for uh, public research and using using varieties produced in plant breeding as a way to increase the potential for improved varieties for everyone. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So um, what's kind of the timeline of the project? Because some of these run for and have to run for several years to to yield that kind of result. Um, so what's the timeline we're looking at here? Yeah, so each of these was, I think, a three-year initiative. Um, and so we're part way through the second one. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. Mm -hmm. um, we have collected a lot of the data, although not run all of the wet chemistry yet. Part of the challenge we've been facing in this round is that the last few years have not had a lot of tar spot present in the field. Mm. What we do is we grow this close to the Great Lakes in a farmer's field that's had tar spot before, but the problem is that we still can't inoculate. Um, the inoculation protocols are not great. Uh, it's an obligate, and so you can't really culture it. Um, mm. The best we've been able to do is that you can bring material in from the summer and maybe kind of get some plants infected in the greenhouse in some sort of mist chambers, but that is not the same scale as being able to really inoculate, you know, a thousand plots in the field, mm -hmm. which is what we would need. And so we're reliant on natural infection, which, which slows things down a bit when we really want to have disease, really, you know, strong disease <laughs> in to be this able controlled to do research. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Huh. So how do you tackle the challenge? Well, the we do our best approach. and we wait. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we've collected some data on some lowly infected lines, which may prove to be interesting because maybe there's something about the initial infection phase that's actually meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, that's exactly what we're doing is partnering with Marty Chilvers again to actually um, try to try to get some things infected in the greenhouse enough that we can do some of our detailed, uh, especially chemistry work on those on those infected samples. Mm -hmm. How important is genotype by environment or even genotype by environment by management interaction? 
this is uh, an entirely important area of research that we were working on. Uh, it, it does relate to tar spot somewhat in that uh, obviously environment plays a really critical role in where tar spot's going to develop and take hold and be, uh, be devastating, right? The yield loss is gonna be dependent on how severe the disease is. And as I mentioned before, that's really increased leaf wetness and, and humidity. And part of that, a large part of that is environment, but there's also a large part of it that's management because if you are irrigating your field and you irrigate in such a way that it extends the period of leaf wetness, let's say you have small amounts of irrigation very frequently, or you have irrigation that's adjacent to kind of the, the overnight dew period, um, mm -hmm. that's gonna really push disease upward. And so we, we could use that to our advantage in uh, increasing disease in our trials, but farmers would want to do the opposite and make sure that they are uh, managing in such a way that they reduce the propensity of the, the plants to get tar spot. Now, this genome by environment by management is actually something we think a lot about in terms of building models to be able to predict into different environments and predict different varieties. And this is a pretty hot topic area, I would say. Uh, especially when you're looking at trying to predict unknown varieties and unknown environments. And one of the big collaborations that we have around that topic is actually through a group called Genomes to Fields. And this is a collaboration of uh, more than 20, I think, different uh, locations across the U.S. and into Canada. There used to be a site in Germany, actually, uh, when there was a researcher there that worked with us. Um, but we grow sort of subsets of the same varieties and collect data in a common way. And we all have weather stations in the fields that are collecting data, we sit in soil samples. So it's meant to create this very large shared data set that can be used for building models and predicting uh, different genotypes and environment combinations. So that's, that's exactly what that project was designed for and it's been very useful and uh, exciting to be a part of. I think it's it's nice when you can bring in new students and they don't have to collect mm -hmm. you know 20 different site years of data to have a meaningful way to test their models. They can use this. And I, I think it's it's used both by academics as well as by industry organizations quite frequently, as it's one of the biggest, if not I think it's the biggest, uh, public data available of this type. Mm -hmm. Once again, the importance of open science, of of good data, um, and uh, yeah, ideally people working together to to create a uh, approaches, data sets. I hear you're passionate about education as well, Adi. <laughs> um, so, so what are your thoughts on education in the field? Absolutely. I have the pleasure of teaching a few different courses. One is uh, the plant breeding course to graduate students. But one of the new courses that I've developed here is called Frontiers in Computational Plant Sciences. And this one is one that we're really passionate about because I've developed it as a project-based course. So we have Uh, graduate students who work on group work, work on projects in groups, and these are students coming from computer science, plant sciences, and plant breeding. Mm -hmm. So mixes of fields and mixes of expertise. And the real goal is not to teach them how to do analyses, but rather to teach them how to think about science, how to ask the right questions, and then how to work together in a collaborative group and how to communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the more exciting things I think that we've been doing with the class is that I've been bringing in outside collaborators. And so if there are individuals that have complex questions or large data sets that they're interested in learning how to how to work with, or they have they have things they'd like to know but aren't able to extract themselves, um, those are the kinds of questions that we like to tackle. And I bring in both the person with the question as well as somebody that has that sort of expertise to get the students started. And then they can pitch the directions they want to go. And uh, we help guide them into sort of if not a solution, at least figuring out a proper approach. It's been a really, a really exciting and fruitful class, I think, and very um, non-traditional, I would mm -hmm. say. But it helps build those skill sets of being able to work collaborative and collaboratively in a group and uh, being able to communicate across disciplines, especially. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it, it feels so organic to what you shared before as well with be, collaboration being s across disciplines being such an integral part of, of your research and your approach and in, in yielding those new methods um, and, and uh, results and even just data <laughs> to, yes. to work off of. And we have had a number of industry partnerships in that course as well. So anyone that's interested, uh, please, you can contact me and we can see if there's a place to slot you into the course. 
Oh, is that um, also true of industry partners? Because this was uh, addressed yes. more towards students, but uh, I assume, or but this is addressed to everyone. <laughs> anyone? Yeah, no, I meant uh, industry partners or academic partners, anyone that would have either a data set or a particular type of expertise that they're interested in working with. Uh, so we have a, two or three of these modules each spring semester. Mm -hmm. And there's always a lot of excitement around choosing what the modules might be. And the fun thing is that computational plant uh, sciences can be anything from bioinformatics to phenomics and everything in between. Love that. Yeah. So um, listeners out there, you've, you've heard it. <laughs> Let Adi know if you're interested in, in cooperating on that, or even if you just want to uh, find out more about all of that amazing research going on, um, you will be able to uh, see the links and way to contact uh, Adi in the show notes. So um, yes, thank you for your time, Adi, and for letting us in to your research and your educational passions. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening in today. Want to learn more? Then check out our show notes and more info on Computomics.com. If you have questions or want to propose a next guest, please reach out to us at podcast at Computomics.com.